Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Bible Believers Community Church. The name says it all. We believe the Bible, and when we line up with the Bible, we know we're right. And when we don't line up with the Bible, we may think we're right. But if we're not lining up with this book, we're wrong. And so it's Wednesday night, and um, we're changing our format a little bit. And we hope that you enjoy the new format. Wednesday night is Bible study night, and so we're going to do our best to make it a little more casual a uh, little less formal, a uh, little less preaching, and a little more, more teaching as we go through the Bible. We're here on the internet, and um, the only people I have here is my wife, Lisa, and my dog, Gus, and my dog, Gracie. You can probably hear Gus, he's chewing on the bone, and uh, hopefully that's not too distracting for you, but uh, um, he's a good boy, and we just enjoy having him around us. So when we don't have people coming to church, we bring the dogs. And if people do come to church, we won't bring the dogs because they'll keep pestering them to get petted and whatnot. We're studying the book of John. We're in chapter 8. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 8. We're going to be reading through verses 1 through 11, and then we're going to move on from there. But um, here's the deal. We're... There's, you can see there's no whiteboard here. I'm actually seated, seated and not standing. And um, we're going to try and somehow work in some new technology. Some new, we're not going to have it this week. We're not ready for it. We've had a really busy week. Uh, but if you're a visual person, forgive us because you're not going to have any graphics today. You're not going to have any verses written up on the, on the board. But let's, without further ado, get into our Bible study. Look at John chapter 8 and look at verse 1. It says, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do thank you. Even though this is less formal, Lord, we still need you to guide and to lead. It's your Holy Spirit that leads us into all truth. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help me to teach um, truth and no error. And Lord, we pray that the people that are listening can have a deeper love for you, a deeper love for your word, and God, that they look forward to hearing more about what the gospel according to St. John has to say. Lord, that their lives would be modified in a way that's pleasing to you, that they walk uh, a more holy life, a more righteous life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, we're in the allergy season, so I might have to stop every once in a while and itch my eyes. <laughs> I was out doing yard work in the church all day so that my allergies are kind of bugging me a little bit. So last week, we asked the question, what did Jesus write down? I mean, he stooped down and started writing in the dirt, and he freaked everybody out. They all got convicted. Uh, conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, people blame a preacher. They say the preacher's message was so tough in it, and um, I didn't appreciate it a bit. It made me feel bad. Well, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you. It's not the preacher. The preacher doesn't have the physical capability to um, convict you. So here, the Lord, 
who's part of the Trinity. He is God the Father, he is God the Holy Spirit, and he is God the Son all in one. He sits down and stoops down and starts writing with his finger, and one by one, they all get convicted. Now, I don't think he just wrote down a Bible passage. We talked about this last week. I'm not going to go into it again. If he just wrote down a Bible passage, why didn't they all simultaneously get convicted and leave at the same time? But that's not what our scripture records. The scripture says that they got convicted and they left one by one, starting at the eldest, going to the next eldest, then the next eldest. It went from the eldest all the way down to the youngest in order. So I think it was a little bit deeper than just writing some scripture in the dirt, but who knows? So there's been all sorts of speculation over the past 2,000 years asking the question, what did Jesus write in the dirt? We concluded that the Bible leaves it blank. And God does everything for reasons. If God left it blank, he left it blank for a reason. God decided not to reveal what he wrote down. And I would say, and people say, well, why wouldn't God tell us what he wrote down? I would say it was an individual message to each individual that was standing in accusation against that woman. And that, that, that each individual, Christ wrote down something that was specific for them. Now, I don't know what it was. I, I made some guesses last week. If you want to know what my guesses were, you could go back and watch uh, last week's message. But I'm going to tell you something. It really doesn't matter. God decided not to include it. And so a guess is just that. It's a guess. Nobody knows what was written. God decided not to reveal it. So if any preacher emphatically states, this is what he wrote, this is what he said, this is how he got them to leave one by one, they just offer a private interpretation, which is a violation of scripture, according to Peter. I mean, Peter said, no scripture, no prophet, no prophets, no prophecy of any scripture is of a private interpretation or words that effect. It's not a memory verse of mine. So last week we left off in verse nine in our text. So let's continue there. It says, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And so to me, this verse implies that this was more than just scripture. And perhaps it was a revelation that the Lord wrote down a, an individual sin of each one of those people because he did make the comment he that is without sin, let him first cast the stone. And so maybe after saying that, he stooped down and started writing, the oldest guy did this sin that's worthy of death, the next one did this sin that's worthy of death, the next one, who knows? It's a guess at best, and it really doesn't matter. But I think that if you look at the whole scripture, he didn't just write down what the Levitical law said about catching somebody in the act of adultery, even though in that law, and we looked at it last week, in that law, guess what? It's not just the woman that gets put to death. It's the man and the woman that gets put to death. And so if this woman was caught in the very act, where's the man? Because if they could bring the woman caught in the very act, guess who else was caught in the very act? The man. And so... Maybe the man was buddies with the guys that caught him. Maybe they did it on purpose because the, the Bible says they're trying to trap Jesus. And so maybe they knew that the law said the man was supposed to be put to death too. And maybe they thought they'd take this woman and Jesus would get all worked up and say, yeah, let's stone her. And then he violated the scripture because the man didn't get stoned. That's a possibility. And so we see all kinds of possibilities as we look at these scriptures. And, um, you know, most scripture is that way, especially when it's a historical account of something that took place because you've got motives of the people that are trying to do whatever it is they're trying to do. Plus, you have emotions of the people that are in the crowd. Plus, you have the supreme, perfect knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ who can read the hearts of men. And so... It can go all different ways. So in our text, verses 10 and 11 are self-explanatory. Let's look at them real quick. It said, when Jesus had lifted himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, 
Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? There's not a whole lot of deep stuff to dig in there. Jesus wrote until everybody left. And when everybody was gone, he stood up and said, where's those folks that was accusing you? And uh, he asked her the question, hath no man condemned thee? And of course she answers and says in verse 11, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And so even though those verses are self-explanatory, I think that there's some things we can look at. Verse 10, when cross-reference with John 3, 17, speaks to the current time. Look at uh, John chapter 3 and um, verse 17. John 3, 17. It says, For God sent not his Son, the Son is the Lord Jesus Christ, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Wow, that fits right in with Jesus here in this passage. Uh, it speaks to the current time, but this changes at the second advent. When Jesus comes back, the first time he was sent, he was sent not to condemn the world, but to save the world. When he comes back the second time, it's going to be just the opposite. Look at... Uh, Oh, look at Matthew chapter um, 25, verse 30. Matthew 25, 30. This is Jesus speaking to his, and it's, and it's a, a parable. It's a, it's a story that brings about truth. And he's speaking about his second advent in this story. And he says, and cast ye the unprofitable, unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, second advent, and all the holy angels with him, second advent, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, second advent, coming into the millennial reign of Christ. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from his goats, from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick and he visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now we're going to pause there for a minute because there's just something I want to hit on. You know, when you talk poorly of the poor, when you belittle the poor, when you uh, judge somebody that's not in a social status that you're in, when you ignore somebody that you're acquaintance with and they're sick, um, you're doing wrong. <laughs> you're doing wrong. You should visit friends in the hospital, not even friends. Friends, yes, of course, but acquaintances. What if you heard somebody in your church was in the hospital and you hardly ever took a chance to get to know them? Maybe that would be a good time for you to go and get to know them and minister to them, try and help them out. God takes pleasure in that, and we see that clearly in this passage. So let's pick up with verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, hell wasn't prepared for man. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 42, for I was a hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drunk no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? 
Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not, uh, not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, listen, I am a dispensationalist. I believe in the dispensations of the Bible. And dispensationally, this isn't talking about people in the church age. Dispensationally, this is talking about people through the tribulation. These movies that you see of the tribulation where somebody, uh, a small group of professing Christians get into this little commune and they're taking care of one another, but they're not helping anybody else. As a matter of fact, they're guarding so nobody else can come in because they're afraid of being captured. That's contrary to scripture. Part of enduring to the end is feeding those that are hungry that didn't take the mark of the beast, giving food to them, giving water to them, taking care of them, even at the risk of being caught. And um, you need to do that. So eventually the whole world will be found guilty before God. Look at Romans 3, um, it's either 3.19 or 3.14. Romans 3, I think it's 3.19. Romans 3.19. Romans 3, 19. It says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, that saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. So eventually Jesus is going to come back, and he's not coming back like he came the first time. He's not coming back saying, my father sent me not to condemn the world, but to save the world. That first uh, advent was an act of mercy. That first advent was the Lord Jesus Christ uh, coming to, to create a solid uh, foundation for redemption for his creation. And his creation continues to reject it. And they're gonna wind up being those that are cast into a lake of fire. And uh, now's the time to come to the Lord. So not only guilty, I mean, the Bible says that they're going to be guilty, but they're going to be speechless. Look at Matthew uh, 22, verse 12. Matthew 22, verse 12. They're going to be speechless. And of course, I'm, I'm kind of taking, I'm just going to say right off the bat, this is another parable, and it's kind of taking it out of context because it's after the judgment, but it is the judgment. And it says in that verse, it says, And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither, in hither, not having a wedding garment? And of course, he's talking to Satan, because this is the wedding feast of the Lamb. And basically, he's saying, if you belong here, you're going to be clothed, and you're going to be clothed in righteousness. You're going to be saved. If you're not saved, you won't have a wedding garment. And the master of the wedding says, What are you doing here, not having a wedding garment? And... He was speechless. <laughs> the person that thinks that they're going to go and, and uh, present their cause before the Lord, that they're going to go and represent a defense against uh, their life that they lived on earth, when they get in front of that absolute holy God, the God of the universe, the God of all righteousness, they're not going to be able to say a word. They're going to be speechless. Uh, we see that, and we're, we've been doing a study on the book of Job, which is going to be postponed uh, until we finish the book of John. We're going to cut out one of our services. But, but the, we see in the book of Job, at the latter end of the book of Job, God calls on Job to give an account. And Job says, uh, I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to sit here and be quiet. I'm filthy. I'm dirty. I'm unclean. And God says, oh, no, 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 you're not going to get away with that. You're going you're gonna to stand up like a man and give an account of yourself. So verse 11 had some things that were uh, of special note. If Jesus Christ condemns you, Jesus said in verse 11, she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. If Jesus Christ condemns you, you've had it. There's no place to go. And if, if he forgives you, you've got it made in the shade. So if he condemns you, you've had it. And um, we looked at uh, 
John 3.17, but look at John 3.19. I knew I was going to go to John 3.19 when I, we went to John 3.17. I said, hmm, I'm not sure if it's 17 or 19, because I knew we had intentions of going to 3.19. So John 3.19, it says, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Let's cross-reference that with Acts 17.31. Acts 17, 31. This is how you learn your Bible, by comparing Scripture with Scripture and not uh, just by sitting in a group of a circle of people reading a verse and saying, now what does that mean to you? <laughs> it doesn't matter what it means to you. It doesn't matter how you define Scripture, folks. The Bible will define itself. And so you compare Scripture with Scripture to get biblical truth. So Acts 17, verse 31, it says, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So God raised uh, Christ from the dead with the intent of being a proof that he is the Son of God, that he is God Almighty, that he is the Father, that he is the Son, and that he is the Holy Spirit. And that's how you get saved, by believing that. You can't say Jesus was a great teacher and think that you're, well, you can, I guess, say that Jesus was a great teacher and think that you're saved. Not according to the Bible. Jesus was more than just a great teacher. As a matter of fact, if he isn't God Almighty, then he's a liar, and a liar is not a great teacher. And so you got to uh, put things in perspective. Either Jesus is who he said he was, and if he was who he said he was, you better do what the book tells you to do. <laughs> Either he was God or he was a phony. He was God, folks. I don't have any reservations about it. He was God the Father. Uh, Philip, you've been with me so long and you don't know if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Now, the Bible correctors will take that statement where Jesus says, I and my Father are one. They'll say, well, what Jesus is saying is that they're, they're one in purpose. That's not what the verse says. It says they're one and of the same. They are one. And so uh, one of my favorite preachers does that gesture. <laughs> and uh, I love him dearly. Um, not just because he's my son. I love him dearly because he's, he's doing his best to be a good man of God. So let's look at John chapter 8, verses 12 through 18. Verse 12 says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The, ther the Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest records of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I came or whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. So um, Jesus talks about his witness, and if I was to title this message, it would be, Is the witness of Jesus true? Because that's what's brought into question with this portion of Scripture. Is the witness of Jesus true? So he talks about his witness, he talks about his record, and this brings up a very interesting study that we're not going to look at today, but we might, it might, I might be giving you a preview of a coming attraction, we might be talking about it next Sunday, no guarantees, I'm still praying about what the, we finished our series on Sunday of the uh, mysteries of the New Testament, seven mysteries of the New Testament, and I'm still praying about what the Lord wants me to preach on Sunday, but so far... I'm feeling like the Lord's leading me this direction. So that preview of coming attractions is this. 
We're going to be looking at the names of Jesus in association with the articles of the tabernacle of the Lord, the light of the world, the bread of life, those types of things. And it's a very interesting study, to say the least. So um, Jesus is a true witness. Gus, don't you be bumping that camera. You get over here and lay down. Jesus is a true witness. Jesus said, uh, um, at one point he said, if, 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 I, if a man, I'm going to wait till we get there. Um, so these idiots will continue to ask Jesus over and over again, just tell us plainly. And here they're saying unto him, you know, then spake Jesus unto them, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus is identifying who he is. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. And then the Pharisees who keep saying, tell us plainly, tell us plainly, tell us plainly. Verse 13 is a commentary to them. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, thou bearest record of thyself. They knew that Jesus was claiming to be God. <laughs> Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. They knew what Jesus was claiming, but they weren't going to have any of it. They didn't want to believe it. And I'm going to tell you, the witness of Jesus is true. We're going to look at some scripture about it. So herein lies the problem for all humanity. Unbelief. Mm -hmm. Unbelief is the problem. It must be noted that Jesus had other witnesses, but... It must also be noted what Jesus said in John 5.31. Turn back to John 5.31. And this is, I think this is interesting. Many people say this is a contradiction in the Bible. I don't buy it. John 5.31. Jesus says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. <laughs> and then over here in John chapter 8, verse uh, 12, um, uh, or not verse 12, but it's going to be in the next verse that we look at, which will be verse um, 14. Jesus answered and said unto them, though I bear record of myself, my record is true. And he's going to tell them why his record is true. If he just came and said, I'm God and did nothing, his record wouldn't be true. But his record is true. Jesus is a true witness. Look at Proverbs 14.25. Proverbs 14.25. Proverbs 14 and verse 25, it says, A true witness delivereth souls. <laughs> That's all Jesus came to do on this first advent, to deliver souls. He's a true witness. A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. So what have the Jews done for the past 2,000 years? They've tried to say that Jesus is a liar. Yeah. Jesus came telling lies. And they go further than that. They blaspheme. They say Jesus was a fornicator. Uh, they um, propagate the idea that Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a... a, a, a sexual relationship which they didn't jesus never committed one sin he never even loved you know these things like the last temptation of christ jesus never lusted after anybody the bible says that he was tempted in all ways like we are yet without sin Amen. and so the devil tried to throw mary Magdalene in front of him to get him to lust after her, but he didn't lust after her he tried to uh, and i'm and i'm let me correct myself i'm not going to say that the devil did send Mary Magdalene to tempt him because I don't know that Mary Magdalene, but rest assured, if he's tempted like all men are tempted, he had a woman come into his life that was would have been a temptation to him, but he wasn't tempted. He did not, well, he was tempted because he was tempted in all matters such as we are, but without sin. So he never lusted after any woman that came in front of him. He never lusted after wealth. He never lusted after food. He never lusted after anything. And, and with that being said, and I'm just going to say this real quick, it's not even part of, of today's lesson, but I'm just going to say this real quick. Um, covetousness has a bad name that's not necessarily a bad thing. The Bible says covet those gifts which are the most um, um, of highest value, and I'm paraphrasing that for sure. 
but there's good things to covet. I say sometimes I covet your prayers, and I do covet your prayers. You want to support this ministry? Pray for us. Pray for us. And so I do covet your prayers, and that's a good thing. If you're ill, you should be coveting prayers of other Christians around you so that the Lord might heal you. But there's a covetousness that's good, and there's a covetousness that, are, that is bad. Covet those good things. Um, I want to serve. I covet... Uh, putting aside all my sin and serving the Lord in perfection. I covet that, man. I wish I could do it. And I do my best to do it, but I fall on my face. So Jesus was a true witness. We looked at Proverbs 14, 25. A true witness saves souls or delivers souls or words to that effect. I don't have it in front of me anymore. I've already changed. Look at Revelation 3, 14. Revelation 3, 14. Jesus was a true witness. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. This is the Lord Jesus Christ talking. And um, he says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the Amen. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the one where it says I am, that maybe it's, um, maybe it's 114. I'm looking for the one where it says uh, um, truth. Something to, uh, I'm coming truth. And I think that's um, before it starts talking about the church, so it's probably in chapter one someplace. Uh, I put a one where it shouldn't have been, I think. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and Jesus and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Well, I was talking about Jesus, but there's a verse there in Revelation that talks about um, um, him being the truth, the truth. And I'm sorry that I goofed it up, but there is a verse that says that. So look at Jeremiah 42, verse five. Man, these fat fingers of mine are getting to where oftentimes I do that and I apologize. Uh, Jeremiah 42, verse 5, it says, then, said, then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be true and faithful witness between us. Jesus is a true, he's the Lord, and he's a true and he's a faithful witness. And, and um, he is a true and faithful witness between us. Uh, I'm not going to just stop there. If we do not even according to all the things, all things for that which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. So the Lord is a true and a faithful witness. Um, these Pharisees are one to say your record is not true. Um, that brings about a conversation from the Lord Jesus Christ. 3, 7 and 3, 14 both. I said 314, and when I read it, it maybe I wasn't looking at 3. Because I did say 314, that was my verse. I was looking at 414. 314, but their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth this, the same veil. That's not it? That's 314. No, not Revelation 314. Oh, I mean, Corinthians for crying out loud. 314, I guess I didn't fat finger it, but I was looking at the wrong verse. Um, okay, my 314 says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodicean, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. I, I highlighted everything, but I didn't get the whole verse highlighted, so I thought it was over. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So, and if we cross-reference that with the, uh, 
John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 we see that Jesus is the one who created all things and he is God and he is a faithful and true witness and so um, so the Pharisees say unto him thou bearest record of thyself thy record is not true uh, the Pharisees seem to have a problem with I don't think, I think they had two problems and I think those same two problems are prevalent in today, in the day and age that we live in. And that is number one, either they just don't know the scriptures and we have countless preachers in the world today who just don't know the scriptures. And they create doctrines, not by comparing scripture with scripture, but they'll grab one verse and they'll build a doctrine out of that one verse and um or they'll define that verse through their own intellect their own knowledge their own wisdom oftentimes they'll turn to the greek or the hebrew in order to mislead folks instead of comparing scripture with scripture they go to some you know you, the folks that are against the king james bible say it's an old archaic book it's not as old and archaic as hebrew and greek <laughs> And so, I mean, they'll run to Hebrew and Greek like that's okay, but we got to stay away from the King James because it's archaic. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny how men's minds work? So either they're um, ignorant of the Bible, and ignorant doesn't imply stupidity. I think some of these folks that I talk about who I think are ignorant of the Bible have super high IQs. They're smarter than me. <laughs> they're smarter than me. But that brings us to the second thing that folks mess up with today, and that's unbelief. See, the advantage that I have over these brainiacs is I have faith. I have faith in this book. I believe this book from cover to cover, including the cover. I believe that God told us what he wanted us to know, and I believe that through his word and comparing scripture with scripture, you don't have to have me to tell you what the Bible's saying. The Bible will interpret itself. And you can take a phrase and, and um, you can run out of phrase. And, um, you know, if you want to see more about what a true witness is, just go to uh, blueletterbible.com and type in the phrase um, true witness and see what verses come up that talk about a true witness. And you're, you know what you're going to see when you see the verses that talk about a true witness? You're going to see descriptions of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. And so uh, Jesus answered them, verse 14 of our text, John 8, 14. Jesus answered them and said unto them, Though I be a record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I can come or whither I go, whither I go. And so we already compared that with uh, 531 where Jesus said, if I bear witness of myself, uh, my witness is not true. But now he's saying my witness is true. And here's why. Here's why my, re my, my uh, record is true. And his record is true. Jesus knew his record was true because he knew where he came from. And he didn't just get born a natural birth that we have since the beginning of Adam and Eve to the present day. His birth was very unique. It was a virgin that never had any sexual relationship with anybody ever. And God Almighty said, I'm going to come in the form of a man. And he entered her womb as a fertile human egg. <laughs> and he developed in a womb, just like we develop. In a, if you stop and think about that, that reminds me of our mystery that God was manifest in the flesh. That, he, that God was manifest in the flesh, but not through fleshly means, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so he grew in that womb and his bones were created in that womb and he went out of a birth canal, just like a human being goes through a birth canal, but he was God Almighty. And he never sinned once, not even in his childhood. He never sinned once in his life because he knew from the womb that he was God. Yeah. He knew where he came from. And he says, my witness is true because I know where I came from. I know who I am. And my witness is true. Whether And listen, Jesus' witness is true today whether you believe it or not. It doesn't matter if you believe it. 
Your unbelief doesn't change the validity of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Doesn't impact it one bit. The disbelieving Pharisees didn't have any impact on the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the power, the saving power of his shed blood. Their unbelief had zero impact on any of it, on any of it. And so uh, you may say, well, I'm comfortable in my beliefs. Well, maybe you need to get uncomfortable in your beliefs. If you don't believe the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe it's time you look past what you uh, feel about things. So Jesus knew where he came from. Uh, uh, he had other witnesses besides just him and the Father. Here he says, uh, um, uh, where does he say that? Uh, verse 18, we're not there yet, but in verse 18 where he says, there's two witnesses, me and the Father. I bear witness of myself and my Father bear witness of me. But we're going to look at it. We're going to run through some scripture because he had more witnesses than just him and the Father. He had more witnesses than him and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Even though those were three witnesses to who he was, he had more witnesses than that. The Bible talks about John the Baptist being a witness to him. And so he had more than just two or three witnesses. So uh, um, verse 16, Jesus says, he judged, if he judges, he judges in truth. He judges, his judgment is true. Verse 16. Um, well, before we go there, verse 15 says, uh, ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. Look at uh, chapter 7 and verse 24 of John. See, man's judgment is skewed, it's messed up. Jesus exhorts them to judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. I don't care how clean of a life you live. I don't care how sanctified you are. I don't care how holy you believe yourself to be. Um, and, I don't, and I'm not making light of any of those things. It's, it's good to be righteous. It's good to be holy. It's good to uh, um, do the right things. And I'm not making light of that at all. But I don't care how, how sanctified you are. When you make a judgment from a human perspective, you're skewed with what limited knowledge you have. You're skewed with assumptions that you've made based on your past experiences. You're skewed with um, prejudices that you might have, which are also usually based on past experiences. And I know to say talk, talking about prejudice is something that's just um, not popular today. You should never talk about that. And yet prejudice exists all over the world. Um, and it's not just, and listen, I'm not gonna go down this road, but it's not just white people that are prejudiced. <laughs> it's not. And so um, as being called of God, we need to put those prejudices aside because God wants to save all men. Amen. And we should put our prejudices aside. And if we're going to do judgment, we should do judgment in such a way where we recognize, we should do self-evaluation and recognize where our judgment could be skewed. And listen, I'm not just talking about judging people. I'm talking about judging doctrine. I have dialogue with somebody on a regular basis and we question different doctrines and we uh, delve through the Bible to look at what the Bible says about things because some of the prejudice that a preacher has, and let me tell you something, preachers have prejudice. I'm not saying that they're prejudiced against other people, but they're taught things in seminary and they, they come to believe the things they're taught in seminary. When they get out and start studying that stuff, they may find that some of that stuff they were taught in seminary isn't doesn't have a biblical basis to it. Um, seminaries all over the world, uh, they don't even know what divorce is about. <laughs> and they skew the teachings on divorce and they do it out of their own prejudices without biblical basis. And I'm not going to go into that. That's not the purpose of today's message. But, but Jesus says, ye judge after the flesh. And that is what I'm talking about. I don't care if you're sanctified. You judge after the flesh. 
You are limited to your personal experiences in life that skew the way you look at things. And and um, I taught about this months ago in a message entitled The Baggage That We Bring. The baggage that we bring. You take two people that were raised in a similar environment. You know, perfect example is me and my two brothers. There's three boys raised in the same environment by the same environment by the same parents, we went all to the same school and you couldn't find three folks that are more different than me and my two brothers. And I'm not saying that I'm different than them, but they're alike. That's not what I'm saying. My oldest brother has little in common with my middle brother or me. That's reality. And my middle brother has little in common with my older brother, I'm the youngest, uh, has little in common with my older brother or me. And of course, if you finish that, um, saying, I mean, we come from totally different perspectives on our views on God. Our oldest brother, I believe, is a Mormon, and my middle brother is a Presbyterian preacher, which um, it, we don't line up theologically. And, and um, But we were raised in the same environment. Well, what makes us different? If we were raised in the same environment, went to the same school, shared the same teachers, had the same subjects taught to us, how did we wind up so different? And the answer is simple, our personal experiences. My brothers didn't go through every single thing that I've gone through in life. I had a skiing accident once, a water skiing accident where I bit my tongue off. My, neither of my brothers bit their tongues off. That kind of makes me think of water skiing a little bit differently than probably they think about water skiing. Um, uh, there, there's just been different, my oldest brother, was in a car wreck when he was in college coming home and he broke his back and he's been in a wheelchair for 40 years. I didn't experience that. But you don't think that had an impact on how he sees other drivers, how he sees his vehicle and his driving skills and everything that goes with driving? And those are just microcosms of things that cause us to judge after the flesh. We have our own personal experiences that get in the way of us, uh, you know, Jesus said, judge righteous judgment. We need to pray about that, especially if we find ourselves judging a situation. There are so many Christian counselors that will sit down and, and they'll listen to the, a story of somebody that needs counseling, and I'm not making fun of counseling. I think there are some good Christian counselors out there. But what point do they start relying on their superior education? I have a doctorate in counseling. I'm a psychologist and a psychiatrist, and I've got more degrees than a thermometer, and I've got all the answers. Well, you know what? You're judging after the flesh. <laughs> you're judging after your own intellect, your, your, your judgment. You know how that judgment should be? That judgment should be coming from your knees. <laughs> That judgment should be prayerful judgment. Lord, help me to judge right. Help me to see this thing right. Uh, recently, and it's one of our more viewed uh, messages of late, uh, I preached a message on how to biblically disagree with another brother or a sister in Christ. And um, probably something that I left out in that message is the prayerfulness that needs to go with it. You feel like somebody did you wrong and you start judging from the flesh. There's different personalities. I'm a type A personality. You know what the biggest fear of a type A personality is? Being taken advantage of. And if you don't think that skews my vision on some things, you're wrong unless I'm prayed up. Now, God, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can get beyond my fleshly judgment and I can give righteous judgment because I can do all things through Christ. Not through my intellect, not through my schooling, not through my superior uh, knowledge of the Bible, not through uh, the fact that I've read my Bible more than probably most people, if that's the case. Um, but you can get past all that stuff because I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Christ says, judge righteous judgment. We have, the, if God wouldn't set it if we didn't have the capability to do it, but I don't think we have the capability on our own, just like we don't have the capability to be saved on our own, amen? 
Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So Jesus says, ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. Well, we already saw he came to this world the first time, not as a judge. <laughs> and, and, you know, you can say, well, he judged folks while he was here. No, he didn't. He didn't. He came and healed and forgave and embraced and loved and showed compassion and fed and gave peace so people could sleep that probably weren't able to sleep because they had no peace. He didn't come to judge the first time he came. He's going to come to judge on the second advent. But this first advent, he didn't come to judge. He came to save. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And who's lost? Every human being. And he came to seek and to save that which was lost. So he came to seek and to save every human being. And that brings us to... Verse 16, Jesus says, if he judges, his judgments are true. Verse 16, and if I judge, my judgments are true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. Um, if it's true, he tells you why it's true. He doesn't just say, my judgments are true because of my superior intellect, even though he had superior intellect. But he's relying on his godhood. He's relying on the Father. And he is the Father. But he's relying on his personage of the Father. And his knowledge of all things. And so he says, uh, and, if, and yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. That's why his judgment is true. He is a judge as God. And, uh, you know, the Bible has all kinds of scripture that talks about, um, it talks about um, um, the potter, uh, how can the thing that was made say to the thing that made it, why made this thou me that thus, and words to that effect, can, does the potter have power over the pot to make one vessel unto honor and another vessel unto dishonor? Um, the Bible's filled with, um, allegories such as that. So if he judges his judgments are true, why? Why are his judgments true? And we know that part of it's because he's God, but it's also because he has three witnesses. He has three witnesses. So um, let's look at some of these things. Look, let's look at John the Baptist as a witness. That's um, um, Chapter 5, verse 33. Chapter 5, verse 33. Chapter 5, uh, 33, it says, Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. He's talking of John the Baptist. You sent to John, and he bear witness of the truth. He bore witness that Jesus is God. But I receive not testimony from man. That's why when Jesus said, there's two that bear witness, me and the Father, he doesn't rely on the testimony of man. It's that simple. And so uh, he says, but I receive not testimony from men, but the things I say that you might be saved. And so Jesus said a number of times, he also said that his works bore, bore testimony of him. Uh, his works of compassion. Listen, he didn't just come and do some miraculous thing that was meaningless. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He, uh, he gave peace to those that were in trouble. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are, or all ye that are burdened and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen? Amen. And so look at 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7. First John 5, 7. Hmm. I think that's for a different um, chain, but it says in 1 John 5, 7, it says, uh,
It says, for there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, that's Jesus referring to himself again, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You keep saying, I know that people keep saying, you keep saying that God, Jesus is God the Father, and Jesus is the Holy Spirit, and Jesus is the Son. Right there it tells you these three are one. <laughs> Now, the word Trinity doesn't show up in the Bible, but the folks that want to say that the concept of the Trinity is a Roman Catholic concept, they're bonkers. It's a biblical concept. Jesus, the, the and here it says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and we, once again, back to John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And you drop down and it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so uh, Jesus is the Word, and there's three that bear record. And Jesus said, I'm not gonna rely on the witness of men, but there's other men that bear witness to Him. And so this satisfies the requirement of the law. Look at Deuteronomy 19.15. Deuteronomy 19.15. Now, sometimes I have the right verse and think I've goofed up, and the reason why, folks, I'm just gonna be blunt about it. I have a Bible that has very small print, and sometimes I'm looking at it and I can't, um, Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. The law, here's the requirement for witnesses for the law. It says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. There's other verses that talk about witnesses and establish them. They're not all lined up with judgment of sin, but they, um, um, but it's always two or more witnesses. And Jesus had several witnesses. As a matter of fact, Paul talks about uh, 500 witnesses that were around when Jesus resurrected from the dead. And so Jesus is not, um, um, he's not without witness and he is a true witness. Uh, and so Jesus tells them about the law. It is written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. And so with that, we're going to pick up with verse 18. Um, next week, we're out of time. So we're going to pick up with verse 18 next week. And um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do thank you for this time. We praise you for all that you do for us. We pray that you'd help us. We want to do righteous judgment, not fleshly judgment. We want to be uh, pleasing to you in everything that we say and do. So help us, Lord, because we do need your help. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.